Welcome to Reddit Reader. Has someone ever challenged you to something that they didn't know you were an expert at? If so, how did it turn out for you and them? A buddy of mine was at a concert in bad seats and started complaining about it via Twitter. All of a sudden, the band starts reading some tweets and calls my friend up to sit on stage for a couple songs. They sit him at the piano and during the next song, they jokingly go, Okay, piano solo. The crowd laughs for a second, but then my buddy just starts jamming out as he plays piano in his band. Talk about a dream moment getting to play with your favorite band. Reminds me of an awesome YouTube video from a couple years back. In a Keith Urban concert, this young dude gets called up on stage since his girlfriend was holding up a sign saying it's his birthday and wished to play guitar with Keith. For those that don't know, KU is an amazing guitar player. Anyway, the dude gets up there and Keith hands him his guitar, pretty much everyone expecting either a choke job or a mediocre attempt. But the dude proceeds to freaking shred. Keith was like, WTF, and he immediately calls back the band, who had just gone on break, and they played the full song with the dude, owning the all parts, including the solo. Just an amazing gotcha moment, in front of probably 15,000 people. I was out skating in my driveway one day, practicing a difficult trick, for me, over a 6 inch tall board. I had it on its side, trying to land the trick from only 6 inches in height, and I kept screwing it up for a good hour. IIRC. I was trying to land a 360 heel flip and I always had trouble with that trick because I skate goofy to begin with. My neighbor must have been watching because he comes out, grabs the board I'm jumping over, and turns it on its side so now it's two feet tall. He pulls a $100 bill out of his wallet and says, if you can jump over the board and land it, then I'll give this to you. What he didn't know is that I was shitty at the trick I was practicing, but among my skater friends I was known for my ridiculous ollie height. I'm not very tall, but I could put my knees to my chest in a jump and clear 30 inches regularly. So, I took the bet, backed way off, took a running start, cleared the board, stuck the landing, and came to a screeching sideways stop about 6 inches from him. He knew he got played and just laughed while he gave me the money. Good thing too, cause I needed a new deck right then pretty badly. Not me, but my brother and best friend. We were in Baltimore for a baseball weekend in 2009 and hanging out at a bar across the Camden Yards. They had a Silver Strike bowling video game. At our local bar back in Boston, we had one as well. I'm decent at the game, but my brother and buddy were f***ing amazing at this game. Bowling 300 games and whatnot. So, two dudes are playing the game and drinking. We ask them if we can play when they're done. They ask if we want to play them. We said sure. My brother and buddy destroy these guys, like it wasn't even close. These dudes said it was a fluke and they wanted a rematch, but this time for a round of beers. Again, Annihilation City, but they kept wanting to play, to eventually win a game. No lie, after 13 rounds of beers, they finally gave up. They were great guys. We saw them the next day at the same bar and they walked up to us with beers in hand already and said, rematch. To this day, we still hang out with them whenever we go to Baltimore, and to this day, they have never won. I once challenged a girl who was a friend of foosball, not knowing she grew up with a table in her house and older brothers. I even jokingly put money on the game. Well, I learned a bit about humility that night. The icing on the cake was when she drove me to an ATM to get her the money. That's a brutal finishing move. While I'd never claim I was an expert, I used to be pretty damn good at pool. My aunt and uncle had a pool table downstairs and my parents, for a variety of reasons, would go over regularly and spend all day there. There was nothing else for me and my brother to do, so we just played pool all day for years. Eventually we got bored and saw that he had a book on trick shots, so we started doing that for fun. Never really mastered them, but they made for really good practice in understanding how to get the ball to do what you want. So anyway, for my buddy's 20th birthday, he wanted to go to a pool hall and invited a ton of people. Then he told me it was going to be a tournament, drinks for individual games, and a 50-50 type of deal for the winner. He gets half regardless because it was his birthday. Insisted I come, and I caved eventually. Get there. First game. They break. And that was the only shot they got. Rest of mine were pretty similar. At the end, I just looked at him. Told you not to invite me. Found out after that a bunch of them had never even played pool before. Felt pretty bad, so I took the money and bought everyone drinks with it. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader.
people who had considered themselves incels and voluntary celibates, but have since had sex. How do you feel looking back at your previous self? I suppose I was an incel from 23 to 27 after leaving the military. I was depressed, underweight, socially isolated. I never got fat or super into gaming as is stereotypical, just worked out a lot, hung out with my dog, smoked way too much weed, and just sort of forgot how to interact with women, which was probably for the best. Most of my relationships prior to 23 were unhealthy at worst, meaningless at best. Ending that era of my life was a long struggle that took concerted effort towards trying to be more positive and social. One big event was buying and learning to ride a motorcycle at 27. Sort of shocked me out of my routine, opened my eyes to the fact that life was not a downhill slide from the adrenaline-filled days of 18 to 22, that new experiences were waiting to be had. Eventually, I met a woman that I just couldn't bear to have the usual flirt until I awkwardly distanced myself experience with. I forced myself to not mind my wander when we talked. I powered through all anxiety to call and text her daily. I even eventually would do crazy stuff like get dressed up nice and go to dinner with her, not something I would have ever seen myself doing at one point. So, I'm married now. Still have some issues, but very happy. So I'd say nothing to me, just gotta live through it, kid. I used to be the creepy-ass weirdo who by the time I graduated had asked every single girl out. I literally had no idea what I was doing wrong. I was practicing all the classic southern gentleman things that I was supposed to do yet having no luck. Think milady, but only slightly less cringy. It wasn't until I got to college and went on a period of self-discovery that I knew the error of my ways. The first and most important concept that I learned was that women aren't sex dispensaries that you deposit nice coins into and get puss puss in return. They have to choose you. I still kept doing nice things for girls because that's the way I was raised, but I removed my expectations for getting anything in return. The second concept was making myself attractive, and it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. A nice basic buzz cut suddenly turned my oily mop of hair into a clean, presentable style. Went clean shaven on facial hair too, because all I could grow was a piddly pubic hair looking ass beard. Got a benzoyl peroxide solution to start working on the acne. Marching band was my form of exercise to stay fit and avoid the freshman 15. It's amazing how the problems we create for ourselves can get in our own way. I remember when I first found the incel community. It was actually a pretty helpful place. It was more of a support group for people who were unattractive, socially awkward, etc. There wasn't any of this nice guy give sex bullshit. Everyone knew why they were involuntary celibate and just wanted to vent frustrations and get support. It was really good for my confidence. The toxic masculinity started to creep in and took right over as everyone knows. I fell on the incel line of being not attractive, but personality-wise, all I did was play video games. I didn't have anything interesting about my life and so women just weren't interested in me and I never put myself into situations to meet people. New job with great people. I started to do different things. Played hockey for the first time at 30. Joined the group for a couple of traveling tournaments when we got absolutely Vegas-type plastered for weekends in different cities. Job is very much of a hangout and chat type job. Security. So talking with the women on the team on the regular starts removing the air of mystique I had built around them. Got my motorcycle license and did a solo trip across the states from Canada to the Mexican border and back that same year. Started doing Tough Mudders, buying a season pass and traveling to any of the ones I could drive to. Then I got Tinder and just started going on dates. Had a few good, few bad, and then met my wife. All in all, I ultimately blame a World of Warcraft addiction that held me back in my early 20s to my late 20s and just missed out on those socially formative years. Oh God. High school me wore fedoras and believed my superior intellect and science-based social theories were too much for everyone, and that I was really a James Bond type with my knowledge of various fields. Turns out, I was gay as f but so deep in the closet my zip code was in Narnia. Not really that smart in anything, but too ADHD to focus past basic knowledge of anything, and in a desperate need of a new wardrobe. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. People who work in human resources, what is the weirdest sh** you have seen? Not HR, but a company I worked at. Some employees were playing squash or similar racket sport at a gym. One of the guys had been working there for over a year. Nice guy. 
At the gym, someone recognized him and called the police. He was arrested shortly afterwards by armed police for an assassination attempt on the King of Spain. He had fled the country and was using a false name. Worked for a large trucking company. Every employee would get a present on their birthday in the mail and their names on the video board. This week's birthdays are... A guy called to ask if his name could not be on the board. Reason? His twin brother murdered his parents and he did not want to be reminded of his birthday. Got a call from our office in India that staff who supported the night shift were running a brothel from the office. They didn't know they couldn't do that. Still fired. They tried to appeal the decision. Did not work. Worked in HR for a couple years now, mostly for large firms managing facilities within properties. One of the strangest cases was brought about because a client asked us to review CCTV footage as he had driven past the office late at night and noticed the motion sensor lights inside going on and off and was concerned there had been a break-in. Turned out our night security officer, whose primary role is to monitor cameras from the control room, was skipping up and down the corridors because he felt too full of energy and had to get it out of his system somehow. Watching the footage of him skipping, featuring the occasional star jump through vacant corridors for 20 minutes at 1 a.m., really made my day. Caught a site manager with like 50 plus pairs of panties hidden all over his office in Ziploc bags, a multitude of sex toys, and over 100,000 in cash stuffed in ceiling tiles. Took a while to unravel all of that. So you locked out his building access and told the VPs you found 60k in the ceiling, right? <laughs> We did lock him out, but this was in Anaheim, California, and I'm in Atlanta, Georgia, large global conglomerate, so I wasn't present. We terminated him, but during the fallout, it became clear he truly had a very vague idea of how much was up there, so his manager could certainly have pocketed some cash. The whole story was bizarre. Why did he keep the money up there? Afraid of banks? We think he was hiding it from his wife, prepping for a split. There was also a bunch of what looked like offshore bank statements scattered around the office. I no longer work in HR or at this company, but it's my favorite story from my time there. Our benefits team made the decision to eliminate reserve parking as lots of employees were frustrated when they walked past dozens of empty spots in the reserved lots every day. This new policy applied to all of the company's locations. Of course, the benefits manager received hundreds of complaints in the first few days from people insisting they needed an exception for their own personal spot. The best reason by far was from one person who needed a spot close to the door because they were terrified of bobcats. No other context. We didn't have bobcats near the corporate office, so at first we thought they meant construction equipment. Turns out, there actually were sightings of bobcats, like the animal, near this person's location. Last I heard, they were told to arrive earlier to get a closer spot and did not get an exception. I once had a temp job in HR. I was scanning lots of old personnel files, and one perk of the job was reading old complaints against people. The best one I came across was a mediation caused by one member of staff accusing another of witchcraft. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What made you ghost a friend? I told her not to tell anyone, so she told everyone. He knocked on my door one night and said, let's go for a drive. This wasn't that odd since I love driving to cool my head. So we start driving, and maybe 10 minutes in, he starts directing me on where to go. He asks me if I mind making a quick stop. I'm annoyed, but say sure. We end up at this sketchy house in the middle of nowhere, and my buddy goes inside, but tells me to wait in the car. Almost 45 minutes later, he comes back out and says we gotta go to the bar. It takes me about 10 seconds to realize this piece of shit went in there to get coke and was already high. So I tell him that I'm not feeling it tonight and drop him off at his place. Spoke to him once after that when he wanted to hang and I told him I'm nobody's errand boy. Never gave a shit if he got the message because I haven't spoken to him since. That realization that you're the one initiating all the interactions with them and when you stop, they don't notice. Her fiance was arrested and did jail time for possession of child pornography. When he got out, she married him and talked about how excited she was to have children with him. Edit. I understand that people are concerned about any children that are born to these people. I'm concerned too. That said, I cut off contact with her six years ago. 
I can't Facebook stalk her due to her privacy settings. I also moved a few time zones away, so I'm not in the same social circle as her anymore either. All I can do is hope that people who are still in her orbit do their due diligence. It sucks, but that's the option available to me. Started talking shit about me to my girlfriend and best mate. His dad had a history of drinking problems and he was starting to exhibit the same behavior. So, I suggested we should both take a break from drinking for a while and try to focus on some healthier shit. He apparently took that as I'm not the same person and my girlfriend was the person who changed me. Sounds like somebody didn't want to be held responsible for his own actions and it cost him his friend. Only get ghosted. Finger guns. When I came home to find the power off, Bill hadn't been paid. We were friends from work. He had split up from his ex and I needed to be closer to work. We went 50-50 on a rental. He has three kids from the previous relationship. With me being the nerd, I agreed to pay the tech bills. Internet, phone, cable TV. He agreed to pay the power as he burnt more because his kids were over on access visits. Came home, dark house. Hmm, investigate. He hadn't paid the power for ages because his new girlfriend wanted the money. Then I discovered he wasn't paying his rent either. Same reason. Down 5000 power, rent, we were evicted, ghosted. When I realized she liked hating things more than liking them. I hate beer, hate EDM, hate Marvel, hate Channing Tatum, hate football. These are all things she said. It's okay that we don't enjoy the same things, but she'd go out of her way to let me know she hated something and rarely talked about what she liked. We had been friends for years, like long-term sisterhood kind of sh**. I did so much for her over the years and didn't even bat an eyelash. I asked her to watch my cat while I went on a 10-day vacation, a cat that she also loved because it belonged to her family before me. She agreed to watch the cat. I even called her about four days into my vacation to ask her again to go and check on my cat to make sure it had food, water, and a few scritches. When I came home, my cat's water and food bowl were bone dry, and she let out the most tormenting meows I have ever heard. My friend didn't check on her once in the 10 days that I was gone. She played stupid when I confronted her about it and said, oh, I completely forgot. That was the beginning of the end. Edit. As for ghosting her, I had to. After the cat incident, she tried to make me feel guilty for being mad at her for it. I think I even ended up apologizing because she was so beside herself. A few more disagreements accrued after that and I was always put on a guilt trip. I decided that I didn't need that negativity in my life anymore and I ghosted her. To this day, she tries to get back to me. Even through mutual friends, she badmouths me, then tells me how much she misses me. Chick is whack. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. Which conspiracy theory do you believe is true? I feel like the round earth theory is true. Government spread wild and crazy conspiracy theories to discredit conspiracy theorists and make them look like lunatics. That way, when someone actually finds a real conspiracy, People will just go, oh, it's one of those crazy guys. Those sitting at the top of the U.S. society, i.e. political bosses, think tanks, owners of media conglomerates, etc., intentionally see distrust and fear between different factions, races, religions, regions, etc., of American society so that we forget our commonality and we can't see how hard we're all being f***ed over by those at the top. As President Johnson put it, if you can convince the lowest white man he's better than the best colored man, he won't notice you're picking his pocket. Hell, give him something to look down on and he'll empty his pockets for you. Related, companies whose products actively degrade human environmental health, i.e. soft drink companies, plastic manufacturers, oil companies, etc., have very actively and aggressively pushed the personal responsibility angle so that we believe everything is up to us. Not to say that we shouldn't be responsible for our own actions, but they've perverted our sense of what their contributions, sacrifices, and initiatives should be, which could actually have a massive and genuine impact, 
but it also impacts their bottom line, so they sow misinformation. The original nuclear tests in the U.S. Southwest were done to also test the effects of radiation on human populations. The line on the laundry detergent measuring cup is higher than it needs to be. That Coca-Cola came out with new Coke in order to change the original formula to corn syrup from real sugar without people complaining about the subtle difference. David Kelly didn't kill himself. Now, for those who are too young to remember, shortly after 9-11, the U.S. and the U.K. decided to invade Iraq. The rationale was that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, WMDs, even though the U.N.'s chief weapons inspector wasn't convinced. A prominent U.K. weapons expert, one David Kelly, leaked to a journalist that he believed the report alleging WMDs was sexed up in order to give an excuse to go to war, and repeated his claims in front of a parliamentary committee. In doing so, he massively embarrassed the government because he was essentially accusing them of fabricating evidence to give them an excuse to go to war they'd already decided to fight. Two days later, Kelly took a huge dose of coproximal and slit his wrist, severing his ulnar artery on a walk in the woods near his home. Selling ridiculously expensive paintings is a way of money laundering. I've always thought that competition reality shows purposefully send someone home each season that deserves to stay, so that people get mad and talk about it online and get other people interested in watching the show. I don't know if I buy my own conspiracy theory, and I'm not entirely sure what the conspiracy is, but I'll repost the same thing I always post when this question is asked. I had a Vietnamese roommate in college. One time someone mentioned apples and my roommate said he could rip them in half. We all called bullshit, and so he did it to shut us up. It was pretty cool, but then he claimed that all Vietnamese people can do it. That didn't sound right. So now, whenever I meet a new Vietnamese person, I ask, in as polite and not creepy and not racist way as I can, if they can rip an apple in half. And I'll be damned if every person I've ever asked goes, yeah, sure. Also, most of them follow up with, all Vietnamese people can rip apples in half. Then, I always ask if that's how people in Vietnam eat apples, and they always say, no, we just eat them the normal way but all Vietnamese people can rip them in half if they want to. I truly don't know if I'm being trolled or not. If I ask the question and have an apple, I'll always give it to the person who claims they can do this, and they always can. So there's some truth to it, but I cannot figure out why, in my experience, almost all Vietnamese people claim that all Vietnamese people can rip apples in half. That's a weird thing to claim. How are they so sure about what every other Vietnamese person can do? Are they implying that Laotians and Thai people can't do this? Is it a special trick they teach only in Vietnam? I would never claim that all Americans can juggle, or that all white people can juggle. See, I don't know if they're suggesting it's a racial trait or a cultural skill. Or is it that Vietnamese people are just really proud of their culture, so they like to fib about the skills everyone else has? And then when tested with an apple, all Vietnamese people are just so confident that they're awesome enough to do it that they just brute force the apple in half. Or was there a meeting once, and all Vietnamese people realized they could help each other by making wild fruit claims about the skills of the Vietnamese so that they could trick dumb white boys like me into giving them free fruit to test their powers. I would welcome any data anyone else can offer on this. My sample size is admittedly small, about 8 Vietnamese people, so this could just be a statistical fluke. But when 6 people, who have almost certainly never met each other before, independently claim that all Vietnamese people have fruit powers, it makes you wonder whether it might just be true. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What do you genuinely not understand? The process of thought, how we can make so many decisions in a split second. Internal dialogue is crazy. Does everyone have the same sort of inner thoughts? Do animals have internal dialogue? When I think about it, it blows my mind. Oh man, I had a f***ing existential crisis recently when I started thinking about how much my thoughts just popped into my head and I actually have no control of what I think. Like, I don't decide to think something, 
I just do. How the f*** do brains even work? Do I even have free will? Am I just a biological machine running calculations based on previews experience? Not to get too crazy, but man this shit weirds me out whenever I think of it. How I spend hours making a perfectly curated list of shows I want to watch on Netflix, but when I actually have time to watch them, none of them sound appealing and I end up deleting most of the items off the list I spent hours making. How that was not a headshot. Games rigged from the start. Bitcoin, no matter how it's explained to me. Traffic, you sit on the highway driving three miles per hour thinking, hmm, must be a wreck ahead. Then you get clear of the traffic and there was never any clear reason or cause for the traffic. People change lanes and those in the new lane have to slow down to accommodate. Snowballs from there. Exactly. If you stop three seconds to change your way, the next one has to stop that and a little bit more until it becomes a chain and the last one waits for a whole hour. I was really good at math at school until year 10 when we had a topic called numbers and proof. It was about proving that an answer to an equation was definitely right, I think. I don't really know because I never understood a single thing the teacher said that whole term. Highly motivated people. You know the internal demon you have to fight to get something done? It's the opposite for over-motivated people. It's like when you're not completing tasks, you've ruined your day and it eats you up inside. F***ing magnets. How do they work? <laughs> Electrons go brrrr. Sometimes when I'm just sitting there, I become hyper aware of my senses and then the whole concept of existence just confuses the f*** out of me. Any kind of abuse, I have no idea how you can hit someone or something without a huge amount of guilt. I was with a girl who was abusive to me. You truly feel like you can never escape and they think they are doing the world a favor by disciplining you. They are cruel and ignorant creatures who are selfish. They don't give a shit about how you feel as long as you are there to do their work and satisfy them. F*** you, Selena. F*** you, Selena. How perfect strangers make small talk, and how they know when to end the conversation without it dragging on awkwardly. Just thinking about life in the universe. Like, where do we go after we die? Why are we here? Thinking about the universe and how big it is in space and time. Black holes. Why are we here generally, and what's our purpose? If there are other life forms in different galaxies. Most of the humor of popular YouTubers. They literally just scream, make dumb faces, and do goofy dances. Don't see how that appeals to anyone over the age of 10. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What is the scariest thing to happen to you when you've been home alone? I was home alone at my dad's while he was working nights, making my dinner and everything. I was probably about 14 or 15 at that time. I was watching TV while my potatoes were cooking when I heard something slam into the front door. I grab my pocket knife and check it out. Nothing. About 10 minutes later, I hear another bang on the front door. Repeat, and still nothing. Really freaked me out because we'd had a few houses get broken into on my street. Turns out I didn't put enough holes into my baked potatoes and they exploded in the oven. The scariest thing that happened to me, I didn't know actually happened until the following day. I lived in an apartment in a not so good part of a dangerous city with my boyfriend who worked nights. One day our friend came over and called me to let him into our building in a hurry. Turns out this guy had been crouched by my car in the parking lot and had approached our friend and closed in on him. My friend pulled out a weapon and the guy ran off. Upstairs, I noticed that the guy had left a green bundle near my car and assumed he would be back for it. It made me uncomfortable, so I suggested we call the cops. Not five minutes after a cop showed up to ask where the guy had gone, SWAT, K-9, and about ten cars showed up and swarmed our area. Turns out, the guy had escaped from county the night before with two other guys. He was in jail for assault with a deadly weapon and repeated domestic violence offenses. He had climbed the fence in the yard behind our building where our landlord kept his camper, broken into the camper, and stayed there the night before. He had stolen all the electronics out of it as well as a butcher knife and was trying to break into my car before my friend showed up. I had been alone the night before and had taken my dog down to the yard to go to the bathroom. I noticed that the barbed wire on top of the fence had fallen down and my dog was nervous, but I brushed it off. 
The guy had been in the camper watching me the whole time, and I never knew it. Was home alone one night, and it was close to Halloween in 2015. Loud-ass knock on the front door. I was eating dinner, so I slowly but cautiously go to the front door. Open it up, and there is blood all over the front porch, and no one there. Kind of freaked out a bit, thought it was a prank. Called the cops, because what the f***, you know? They said they would send someone there. They called back and said someone was on a bike and fell and was bleeding bad and was going door to door asking for help. I missed the person, but one of my neighbors helped them out apparently. Crazy. Probably pretty lame compared to most stories on here. Was working pretty late, RE 2am, on my computer when I get an alert from my security camera that detected motion. I checked it, and there was a person staring into my apartment window in a full view of where I was working. I closed the computer, turned off the lights, and went into the bathroom for a bit. Turns out being extra paranoid when someone is staring into your apartment at 2 a.m. isn't a good combination. I checked the camera memory, and the guy was there for 20 minutes, just real casual. Called the cops, and the kid ran away and came back an hour later. Haven't seen him since. I was a young kid, home alone, and my mom called the phone and said a tornado was coming, and I had to go to shelter in the basement. The basement was incredibly creepy, especially as a child. I never went down there on my own. So little old me grabs my toy lantern to descend into the basement all alone with rain hitting the windows, with only the flicker of my toy lamp to light up my surroundings while I make my way to the boiler room and shelter in place until someone comes to get me. Imagine that, just sitting there in the darkness, listening to all of the sounds for something like two hours. F***ing freaky. Turns out the tornado missed us by miles. You're braver than I am. Similar story. When I was about seven years old, my parents left me alone at home for some reason. This was pretty odd since they always made sure to leave me with a babysitter or older sibling until I was about 11 or 12. There was a tornado and I was too scared to go into the unfinished basement, so I ran across the street to the young early mid-twenties couple across the street who had a cute dog. They let me in, called my parents to let them know where I was, and gave me candy. I got to hang out with the dog too, which was nice. Someone tried to break into my neighbor's house while I was babysitting their kids. I was 15, and I used to babysit for my neighbors down the block. They had a really nice house, three floors with a built-in garage under the house that connected to the basement. It was the family's most used entrance of the house, and they rarely locked the basement door as long as the garage was closed. They also had the type of security system where any time a door opens, you heard beep, beep, beep. After the parents left one night, I was putting the kids to bed, and I heard the beep, beep, beep. I yelled out, thinking it was the parents coming back for something, but no one answered. The system on the wall kept reading, basement door open. I was freaked out, so I called my dad and asked him to come by since he was only a few houses away. When he arrived, he told me to stay in the kitchen while he checked the house out, but before he could, we heard the Beep, 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 again, and then the garage door opened. When we ran to the window to see if the parents were pulling into the driveway, they weren't. Instead, someone in a hoodie was running out of the garage door and into the woods behind the house. My dad ended up calling the cops. I'm still creeped out by it. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. You are given $1 billion and 10 years with the goal to eradicate the human race. How do you accomplish that goal? COVID-20 Poke North Korea with a stick Step 1. Buy a bat Step 2. Eat the bat Step 3. Go have fun with a billion dollars Form a crack team of ex-Special Forces operators, elite guns for hire, and the smartest rogue IT group I can find sneak into other countries' bioweapon testing center. Have them steal two diseases, one that causes a bad pneumonia in 10-20% to 20 of patients and killing about half of those that need to be hospitalized, and another that has at least a fatality rate of 70%, causing untold damage to all body systems and able to affect anybody. Then. Release the first virus and wait. Once people start coming out, protesting being forced into quarantine, hanging out with friends and family that they have not seen in months, then it is time to release the second virus and watch the mayhem. <laughs> That's a good idea. Wait. 
Nice try, China. Used a billion to set myself up as the world's number one hazardous waste disposal service and do an aggressively shitty job of getting rid of the waste I charge governments for the disposal of. After the first year, I'd float the company on the stock market and use the further profits in research and development for even shittier ways of disposing of hazardous materials. By year five, with the end game in sight, I'd hopefully be using my private space program to dump atomic waste into the lower atmosphere. R&D would be looking at ways of covertly spreading toxic waste in the ocean in a cost-effective manner. All spare change would be spent on aggressive deforestation and orangutan barbecues. With one year left on the clock, my atomic refining program should be in full swing. From there, it would just be a case of making an atomic weapon capable of igniting the atmosphere from the safety of my space station or moon base. Pretty good plan, user piss poor planning. Offer a prize of one billion to whoever kills the most people in ten years. I'm not comfortable with the number of billionaires monitoring the thread. Go to China, order the soup. You won't end the world, but you will have great soup. Completely eradicating humans would be a tough go, but I'll split my billion into a three-prong attack. First, I would split 950 million any way I need to in order to fund two projects. One. Biologically engineer a blight disease tailor-made to attack cold-weather crops such as broccoli, cauliflower, kale, and so on. Basically something designed to attack and kill the cabbage family. 2. Buy real estate around the Yellowstone caldera on one of the fault lines and drill a secret borehole. Hire an evil volcanologist geologist to figure out the best way to set off the supervolcano. TNT? Into the magma chamber? I don't know but I bet with 425 million or so I could figure it out. Then, when those two are ready to go, I would 3. Use the last 50 million or so to hire a no-scruples mercenary team to take out the Norwegian seed bank. Kill the seed bank. Set off the supervolcano. Then, release the blight. Watch the world starve. Hmm. Don't think this would wipe out everything. Supervolcano would certainly do damage, but you'd be hard-pressed to kill every food source even with a supervolcanic eruption. Would not be a fun 599 years, though. Bet Trump $1 billion he doesn't have the balls to nuke Russia. Billion dollars? Ten years? You could do it in a month. Just buy up lots of commercial explosives and set off a big one in the same spot every hour and 49 minutes until the planet splits in two. How big must each explosion be? At least a four. Do the Twilight Zone method. Buy the main power companies, shut off all the power, and turn random people's electricity on and off, making people point their fingers at everyone, and eventually causing complete chaos. With all the first world nations down, all nations below on the pyramid will have nothing to sell their stuff to, making them extremely poor, and eventually have them all starve or die of disease when the government hoards everything. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What item is very useful in a zombie apocalypse, but most people don't think about using it? Motorcycle gear, motorcycle pants, jackets, and gloves are designed to prevent road rash injuries and are really tough. Wearing them, especially if you also use a helmet, makes you immune to bites. Do I still get the neck protection? Travel pillow, sorted. A good pair of running shoes goes a long way. Tie a rope with any object, like a simple padlock. Now you have a meteor hammer, or just swing it like a basic flail. A book on local edible plants and mushrooms. Edit. This comment got way too much attention. Also, yeah, many plants can be misidentified. However, 90% of people couldn't survive off of foraging anyway, and if the book gives slightly more chance, wonderful. A tank. Preferably a British one, as they have integrated kettles. Can't go wrong with a Churchill. A good water filtration device like a Life Straw or Sawyer Mini. One of them can often filter thousands of gallons of water without a hiccup. You can only go a few short days without clean drinking water, so it's pretty likely that you die of dehydration before a zombie actually kills you. This. Just because there are zombies doesn't mean cholera disappears. Most natural disasters kill relatively few people, as the cholera outbreak that really pumps up the death toll. I live on the 11th floor. I think I would just take off the staircase railings and pour some sunflower oil over the stairs. 
Also, a bit irrelevant, but I think a lot of zombies would be walking with their trousers around their ankles. Surely a zombie isn't smart enough to pull their pants up. A bicycle and a slingshot. The bike allows you to cover more ground than on foot and more quietly than anything with an engine. They don't need fuel beyond calories and maintenance is simple. With a little practice, the slingshot can take out small game. Squirrels, birds, maybe rabbits if you're good enough. It makes very little noise and you can pick up ammunition, small stones, ball bearings, nuts, bolts, etc. from basically anywhere. Unfortunately, I don't know how to use either. I guess I have found my lockdown level up skills. A small tool kit, few screwdrivers and a hand drill and you can quietly pull apart or mend most things. Also, olive oil for both cooking and for leaving a nice slippery patch for any of the undead to fall about on. Ah yes, how to avoid zombies with Gordon Ramsay. First, a touch of olive oil. Just a touch. These brains are f***ing raw! Boats. I know some of them have people on big yachts in the ocean, but really a small boat on a lake would be safe from zombies. Even a canoe you could anchor in the middle of a lake and sleep in. A crowbar works as a tool in its own right for opening doors and for levering things open, and is also an effective melee weapon. Armor, as in small metal plates or strong leather, like a thin layer of aluminum or strong leather would do the trick against bites. Added to normal clothing, kind of like steel toe shoes. You never really see someone actually try to build, use any kind of armor against zombies in movies or games. Even a metal armor on the lower part of your arm would make it possible that you can block bites with your metal arm. Cloth. You can pat yourself up if you don't have bandages, make Molotov cocktails, clean yourself with it, and other stuff. Edit. By cloth, I mean towels, clothes, and any kind of fabric. I commented on a post a minute ago about not knowing how to use a bicycle or a slingshot, but I am a rope and duct tape pro. This gives me hope. I am not a serial killer. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. When and how did you find out Santa wasn't real? He's not real? It's just a prank, bro. Go back to bed. A kid at my kindergarten ran up to me and screamed, Santa's not real, then ran off. I sat in the tube slide all recess and had what I can only describe as an existential crisis. My mom was straightforward from the very beginning. There is no Santa. Christmas is about the birth of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, what a savage. When my toys had brand labels on them. When there are two Santas in our local mall one year, and then a Santa appeared at our doorstep one day, and I recognized it as my uncle. There is an unbeliever in our midst. I did not receive a gift after my mom was hospitalized at the age of eight. Our business went down and we didn't have enough money to buy gifts. When I was in second grade, someone in my class told me he wasn't real. That's pretty much it. Nothing jaw-dropping. But I did keep up the charade of pretending that he was real just to make my parents happy because I knew how disappointed they would be if I had found out. Same, I think I was seven or eight when my cousins told me, but I kept up with it until my dad, finally, put an end to it all when I was twelve. You know Santa's not real, right? Yeah. I was nine. I had an allergic reaction to a medication. Made me hallucinate and be unable to sleep, and walked in on my parents stuffing our stockings. We didn't find out until years later that I'm allergic to that medication and that that was an allergic reaction. My parents still maintain that I was just snooping, but do acknowledging the allergy? It's weird. Bummer. Christmas Eve all around, let me tell you. When I was in sixth grade, I caught my parents sneaking presents up from the basement. When the coast was clear, I checked the tags and they read, From Santa. I was 10. Christmas Eve, morning, excitement. Wouldn't let me sleep even past 12 a.m. Heard Dad ask Mom, Is she asleep? And then he quietly sneaking into the room to keep my gift. Saw everything with a little light from the next room. Told them this was well after five to six years. LOL. I woke up near Christmas to find my dad and my uncle testing Mario Kart on my N64 at midnight just to make sure it worked before giving it to me on Christmas Day. Ah, yes, the classic just making sure it works charade. Mother were skidding around penguins on one of the winter courses. I load up Super Mario 64 and someone already had 120 stars on a save file. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. 
what is a joke you heard that at first you laughed, but then were like, damn, that's a good point. Question. What do you call the absolute idiot who graduates last in their class from medical school? Answer. Doctor. This is the story of a man who is a firm believer of God. One day it began to rain very heavily. It kept raining and a big flood came. The man climbed up on the roof of his house and knew that he would be okay. God would protect him. It kept raining and now the water had reached his waist. A boat came by and a guy in a boat said, Hey, jump in. We will take you with us. No thanks, said the man. I'm a firm believer in God. He will rescue me. He sent the boat away. It kept on raining and now the water had reached his neck. Another boat came by and a guy in the boat said, You look like you could use some help. Jump in and we will take you with us. No, said the man. I'm a firm believer in God. He will rescue me. Don't worry about me. The boat sailed away. It still rained and the water now reached his mouth. A helicopter came by and a guy in the helicopter threw down a rope and said, Hi there, my friend. Climb up. We will rescue you. No, said the man. I'm a firm believer in God. He will rescue me. I know he will. The helicopter flew away. It kept on raining and finally the man drowned. When the man died, he went to heaven. When entering heaven, he had an interview with God. After giving a polite greeting and sitting down, the man asked, Where were you? I waited and waited. I was sure you would rescue me as I have been a firm believer all my life and have only done good to others. So where were you when I needed you? God scratched his confused looking face and answered, I don't get it. I sent you two boats and a helicopter. There is that man weeping over his glass in a pub in a small village. A traveler decides to ask him why he's so sad. I've lived in this village all my life. I help build most of the houses here. Do they call me the house builder? No, they don't. When there was this flood ten years ago, I was the one to consolidate the dam and saved all their farms. Do they call me the dam expert or flood canceller? No, they don't. When the fisher boat destroyed the pier, I was the one to rebuild it and allowed the sail traffic to resume. Do they call me the sail rescuer or the pier generator or any cool name like that? No, they don't. But you f one goat. Okay, I think we've had enough Baptist jokes. A man asks his doctor, I'd like to live to a hundred years old. What should I do? Do you smoke? No. Do you drink? No. Do you take drugs? No. Do you have lots of sex with random strangers? No. Do you practice extreme dangerous sports like car racing, skydiving, or stuff like that? No. Do you live on the side of the law? Do you have deals with the mafia? No. Are you in debt with loan sharks? No. Do you eat a lot of fat or sugar? No. So if you do none of all of that, why the hell do you want to live to a hundred years old? A man commits suicide and finds himself in heaven. He's chilling with God and says, You know, I thought suicide was a sin. Nah, it's nothing like that. You have full autonomy, otherwise it wouldn't work, says God. Interesting, he says. Have you ever considered it? Is it even possible for you to commit suicide? God says, Yeah, it's possible, and I've considered it, but I'd never do it. Why is that? asked the man. What if this is all there is? A thinking man's joke. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. Someone gave you a box that contained everything you have lost in life. What's the first thing you'd search for? When I was 17, I shot roll of my film of my then girlfriend, my wife. I remember everything about that day and would give almost anything to have those pictures. We've been together 18 years and married 11 as of next week. What happened to them? Never got developed. It was an old Nico Matt SLR and sometimes the film wouldn't catch to wind it back into the cartridge. I opened it in the dark and wound it by hand but at the time couldn't afford to spend the money to develop photos that might have been exposed. My grandmother's ring. Technically not lost, but stolen by an old flatmate. Twenty years later, that still f***ed me off. F*** you, Brody. Having a scarf made by Grandma, that is the most sentimental thing I own. I feel you on this. F*** you, Brody. First, remove all the sock so you can see what is in it. Next, remove all the pens, pencils, so you can see and pick up what is in the box. Then, and only then, 
Look for interesting stuff. My deleted Minecraft world. My yellow stuffed duck that a TSA agent ripped to shreds because he thought there were drugs or something in it. I was like five and it was my first time on a plane. I have panic attacks going through security every single time now. I'm kind of tired of the TSA. They make getting on a plane unnecessarily slow and arduous. It'd be different if they were good at finding drugs or weapons, but they statistically miss most of the contraband that is sent through in tests. In 2016, my husband and I took our then 8- and 11-year-old children skiing. My son is shy and gets overwhelmed by learning something with others watching, so we were prepared to pack it in and spend the day in the pool if it didn't work out. After ski school, we took them up to the gondola to do a gentle green run, but my son was pretty scared and moving about an inch a minute. My patient husband waited while I went off with our exuberant daughter. It took forever, we had time for hot chocolate at the lodge, and I began to seriously be worried that something might have happened to them, or that my son was distressed and crying. Then my daughter starts tugging my arm and pointing madly. Somewhere on that run, my son had found his groove, and as I grabbed my phone and started filming, he came tearing down the slope like a <laughs> pro, and finished with a gorgeous spray of snow right in front of me, and the biggest smile I'd ever seen. Heart grew three sizes that moment, and I caught the whole thing on video. We spent a lovely day with the kids begging the gondola chiefs to let us up one more time as the sun went lower. On that last amazing run before we went home, I fell and my phone slipped out of my pocket into the snow without me knowing. Since the phone was at a cellular range, the video didn't sync to the cloud. Phone was never found by ski patrol and I assume was destroyed in the spring melt. That video is in my box, and it's one of the few things I want in life. Love the story, but I gotta admit that I was waiting for you to say you lost your kids. A teddy bear, still my favorite to this day, that I lost in Florida for the two years I lived there. I was in first grade, and I lost it in the airport. I had a stuffed teddy bear named Skippy, because I love PB&J sandwiches that my parents lost in storage when we moved downstate. I thought lost, as in couldn't find it, but I later learned that they lapsed in their payments to the storage facility and the company got rid of our stuff. This was when I was around 7 or 8. I'm almost 30 now, and I'm still salty about losing my bear. My classic green Game Boy got lost in one of my mini moves, as well as my GameCube, though I'm pretty sure one of the movers yoinked the GameCube. When I was a kid, I went to this fair in small town Harrison, Maine, where my grandma lived. I was only given like $8 and decided to try to win a porcelain doll at one of the dart games. Unsurprisingly, since I was a kid with nothing, I kept trying and failing and failing again. Eventually, I ran out of money. The person running the stand felt bad for me and let me pick one of the smaller dolls anyway. I love that thing. It wasn't from my grandma, but it made me think of her and she died a year or so after I got it. About a year after that, my family's house was foreclosed on and being a hoarding home was completely condemned. My parents salvaged some things, but only their useless hoard, nothing that mattered to us kids. That doll ended up in a dumpster with the rest of the hoard, and I'll never forget it. That one scene I've been searching for every night since I was 15. Somewhere out there, beneath the pale moonlight. Describe it. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. Doctors who have been in a is anybody here doctor situation? What happened? My wife and I were waiting for a plane to take off, and they asked for a dock over the intercom. My wife got up and there was a guy lying in the aisle, already dead. She couldn't do anything. Had to sign some forms. They got the guy off the plane and made an announcement that the guy was in stable condition, which is technically true for some definition of the word stable. I had a guy die next to me on a plane. They put the oxygen mask on him and pretended he was stable. He was a really large guy, and they discussed what to do when we landed. Decided it would be too hard to get him down the aisle with everyone on board, so they emptied the plane first. Not a doctor, but I was on a flight from D.C. to Chicago and got so sick I passed out upon landing. As I was coming to, I was being aided by a man and heard another person shout, Are you a doctor? The man helping me replied, I'm the Surgeon General of the United States. 
This was Vivek Murthy, and it happened around 2015. He was the kindest and humblest guy. Are you a doctor? I am the doctor. I'm currently a first-year resident in internal medicine in Sweden. This happened last year, about a year after I graduated, and so I was still relatively fresh out of med school. I was flying home from my vacation from the Mediterranean, three-hour flight when they announced on the speaker system that they were looking for a healthcare professional. Stood up when they called out a second time. Maybe 15 seconds later, it was me and a bit older nurse who went up to the front rows where a middle-aged male was awake but unresponsive. As I didn't really have a lot of experience and was somewhat panicking, kept the panic internally to myself, it's scary being alone, I fell back to ATLS and eventually noticed that I had a D problem, decreased strength in one of his arms and one-sided facial droop that was quite mild. Long story short, I suspected a stroke, but couldn't really do a whole lot. We were 30 minutes away from landing at the time of the initial call. They didn't deviate or anything. I didn't feel like I did that much, to be honest, except say that I suspected a stroke and asked if they could call an ambulance to the airport. The airplane seemed to land a bit faster than it usually does as we went off the runway. There was an ambulance waiting off the taxiway. When the ambulance staff boarded the plane, I gave a short report, and that's basically it. I got a thank you from the relatives and the stewardesses. They asked me to write down my name and email, but I haven't heard anything since. Recently, before the coronavirus, I was taking an international flight. The flight attendant asked if there was a doctor on board. I was actually asleep, but somehow that woke me up. And I was like, wait, you need a doctor? Turns out, patient was experiencing some diffuse chest pain. Went to examine him, and my inner alarm bells rang when I asked him some questions. I had a very high suspicion that this guy was having aortic dissection. I told the flight attendant who passed the information on to the pilot. The pilot made an emergency landing at a different airport, met with an ambulance. I later called the hospital to find out exactly what it was, and turns out I was right. If they have carried on, he might not have survived. Edit, aortic dissection is when the aorta tears or is about to burst. My mom has had to respond twice on flights when someone was in distress. The first time was in the air and a guy was having a diabetic low. She monitored him until we landed. The second time was sitting on the tarmac when a guy had a stroke. They delayed the flight and took the dude off the plane. She also said that after the first one, the airline sent her a thank you card and said please use these enclosed vouchers to get tickets to a destination of your choosing, but they forgot to include the vouchers. She said she thought it would be rude to write back and say, hey, you forgot the vouchers. While we were on our descent, somebody lurched over in their chair and became unresponsive. Tachycardic and diaphoretic, the whole episode lasted for about two minutes. Then he woke up and vomited. I figured he had an arrhythmia and recommended he not take his connecting flight to Cleveland and instead go to the ER. EMS was waiting on the ground and helped him off the plane. I actually saw him again on my return flight home. He told me he was diagnosed with arrhythmia and made an appointment to see a cardiologist in our hometown. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What industry is a lot shadier than it seems? My dad knows a story from someone who works for a nationwide grocery chain. They have to deal with an Italian mafia to import balsamic vinegar. More businesses than you think have to deal with mafiosos and gangsters. I once helped a gang relations person with Habitat for Humanity get reassurance that their volunteers would be protected in an American inner city. They apparently always speak with the gangs beforehand for safety reasons. More people died last year over vanilla in Madagascar than cocaine in South America. They've even coined the term vanilla murder. Farmers hire armed mercenaries to guard their crops from thieves near harvest time, and if one is caught, well... Let's just say it's in response to all the farmers that were killed by thieves for the same reason. The maritime industry. Most of the big companies do things by the book and treat crews well because they're afraid of lawsuits and unions. But many smaller mom and pop companies break laws and violate safety regulations with reckless abandon because they're not as visible and can stay under the radar, so to speak. It's very common for a small company to ask a captain or crew to do something illegal and dangerous in order to increase profit, and for the captain or crew to comply out of fear of losing their jobs. And that's just the U.S. maritime industry. 
Sailors from poorer nations who work on ships are often fed little more than rice and cheap ramen for months at a time and paid pennies for their backbreaking work. I love running tugs for a living, but the industry as a whole is rife with shady business. A lot of hobby fish importing is pretty shady. You have farms with certain types of fish, like betas in some areas of the world, that are run with fish in horrible conditions, which is why a lot of the ones you get in major chain stores are sick before you even bring them home. The stores will blame the fish being stressed, but I've ordered and received hundreds of fish from small breeders, sellers, and outside of quarry catfish that really enjoy committing suicide by poisoning their own water. The fish arrive healthy and fine. Outside of boutique fish farming, the way some wild fish are caught are just horrible. The trappers will lightly poison the water supply to knock out the fish, then scoop them out of the water without a care for that area's ecosystem. This has led to the depletion of some natural species to the point that they are now endangered. Lastly, boutique fish sellers and major chains do not give a rat's what happens to the fish in the end. This means that people who buy fish like placos, betas, goldfish, etc. end up getting sick of them and dumping them in local waterways to supposedly get rid of the problem. So in some areas, these fish have completely destroyed the local water ecology because, like other invasive land species, they were never meant to be there. One of the worst offenders is the lionfish in Florida. It's venomous and has no natural predators, so its population has exploded out of control. All industries are shadier than they seem. I used to work for a flute manufacturer, and it was shady as hell. Deets? I don't want to name the manufacturer, but it was around the 2008 financial crisis. The place was equity-owned and leveraged to <laughs> Mars. The CEO was committing bank fraud and screwing contractors while laying off employees and enriching himself. Was there a whistleblower among the flutists? Eyeglasses. You have no idea the snow job they put most people through when it comes to buying them. It's far, far worse than trying to buy a new car from a dealership. Wholesale frames are about $5 to $20. Wholesale lens blanks are another $10. Any kind of dip coating, UV, tinting, etc. is negligible cost and effort to apply. Literally pennies. To top it off, they don't even do a whole lot in-house, but send it to labs, which are basically sweatshops that can take up to two to three weeks when labor time is really under five minutes. Instead of training real opticians and technicians, they're just glorified sales staff now. Most of the time, they don't even bother with proper measurement for PD, frame width, or arm fitting. Was an optician in the early 90s. I'm horrified at what the business has become. Recruitment industry. Some examples. Fake jobs to lure candidates for registration KPIs. Training negotiation tactics of telling a candidate that there is a better candidate who wants less, so we recommend less for you to get the job, especially for contractors. Coveting off, pitching, and telling a candidate they have been sent to a line manager, but in reality, they haven't been submitted because two others from the same recruiter have already been in interviews. If they fail, you might get a chance. A lot of coded ways to put on a database info on your age, non-professional related appearance, and ethnicity. Ageism, sexism, racism is rampant in hiring. A lot more dodgy stuff behind the scenes. Source. Was involved with the industry on a global level for over 15 years before I changed careers. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What's the creepiest compliment you've ever been given? Every day I ride the elevator to the top floor of my office building. One day, a couple of years ago, an attractive 30-ish year old woman got on the elevator at 2 and pressed 8. She got on the elevator, she stared at my forehead the entire time. The elevator reached 8 and she literally backed out of the elevator and held the door. Still staring at me, she blurted out, I know I'm not supposed to say anything, but that is the most beautiful toupee I've ever seen. Then the doors closed without either of us saying another word, and I've never seen her since. Thanks, I grew it myself. This old man lived on my street. I would always say hi to him in the morning on my way out to work. Didn't know him outside that greeting. He must have been in his 70s. Looks at me and goes, You look extra this morning. I double-timed it and stopped talking to him. This is one of the times where I wonder if some old people just see what they can get away with. One time, I dressed up as a zombie to perform the thriller dance at my workplace. 
colleague came up to me and got real close to my ear and whispered, you look great as a zombie. I'm a necrophiliac, by the way. Yikes. I'd be zombie walking my right to HR with that one. WTF. Not gonna find any brains there, though. At Disney once, me and my cousin, I was 16, he was 15, were sitting on a bench waiting for the others to come back from the bathrooms. And a lady, probably mid-30s, stopped and stared at us for like 10 seconds. Then she said, You guys are so cute. Invite me to your wedding. Then gave us a business card with her name and stuff on it. He just silently put it in his pocket, then we both just started laughing. We told our three other cousins, but not the adults. I would do anything to wake up next to your corpse. He sent it with a poem. LOL. A comment on a picture of me when I was 16. With those hips, I would trust you to bear my children. I did that with my wife once. Browsing through old photo albums, came across a picture of her wearing some custom riding attire. She's an equestrian. It was a Kodak 110 pick. Not the clearest pics and limited focusing. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Anywho, I'm looking at this pic of my wife wearing skin-tight riding pants, knee-high cowgirl boots, and a black Dana pattern shirt that came about three-quarters of the way down. Important to note, she's a very well-endowed woman and apparently got her boobies at a young age. Looked at the pic and said, Wow, you gotta wear that in the bedroom one of these nights. She responds, That was taken when I was about 13. I slowly put the pic back in the photo album and never spoke of it again. I love your eyes. I can stare into them all day. Proceeds to stare into my eyes for two minutes straight. I'm a guy, and not extremely lucky in the lady department. I'm not particularly choosy, but that one gave me the heebie-jeebies. I didn't think women were capable of that level of creepy, but I learned that day. I have green eyes with orange speckles. I get compliments all the time, but man are women way creepier than men. I had one lady tell me she loves my eyes so much she could just scoop them up with a spoon and run away. Another girl in high school stared at me for a few minutes before saying she would steal my eyes and shove them in her own head because they were so beautiful. Men, on the other hand, just say, oh my god, they're so beautiful, or wow, are you wearing contacts? I always wear sunglasses now. You're like a pale Buddha, proceeds to touch my belly without notice. I need to know, were you at the time a pregnant woman? I am a man, so maybe. If Barbie looked like you, I'd still be playing with her. Sixth grade girl at science camp I was volunteering at. You have pretty eyes. Me. Thanks. Her. I just want to poke them and watch the blue goo come out. Me. Oh. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What is your biggest fear? What are you afraid of more than anything? Getting psychosis. Not to make your fear any less real, but you really learn to live with it eventually. I've been diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic for a while now, and I can remember being terrified when I first started having delusions. It is scary, and it is different, and can be hard at times, but I'm still me. I hope you never have to face any form of your fear, but if it ever comes down to it, I'm sure you would find a structure that is best for you. That I am too late to achieve what I want in a reasonable amount of time. I feel this way about saving for retirement. Am I too late to catch up? Am I going to have to eat dog food like so many poor old people do? The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. Heights. And I even know it's irrational at times, but it's still crippling for me. But for some reason, I'm totally comfortable with flying. Having a chance and wasting it. Something terrible happening to my loved ones. The ocean. Specifically, open water in the middle of the ocean. Nothing scares me more than being in the middle of the ocean, seeing nothing but water in every direction with no way of escape. Also, all those creatures. I'm helplessly sitting at their mercy. Wow, I got goosebumps writing this. The ocean is such a scary and beautiful thing. The ocean is real power. Power can be a beautiful and majestic thing. Power and fear like a tsunami. No man could ever reach this level of power. Getting my eye poked out by an umbrella and then death. Oddly specific. That I'll discover at death that my agnostic atheist views were wrong, and as such I'm in for some that I'm wasting, I've wasted my life.
But does that really matter in the grand scheme of things? As long as you enjoyed your life, that's all that matters. The way I look at it, we are so small in the universe, we could all disappear one day and nothing would change, and that is much more terrifying. Spiders, in a completely irrational way. In small town Craig, Alaska, there's a few weeks where the grass is covered in these spiders. I quickly learned which of my co-workers were afraid of spiders. Aging. I could care less for immortality. I'm okay with death, but the act of cellular degeneration over periods of time is what terrifies me the most. Imagine being old and practically incompetent, taking God knows how many pills a day for your countless prescriptions. I'm 20 years old, and I still fear the act of aging. I hope when 2040 arrives, there will be necessary precautions to stop our body from breaking down, and hopefully increase life expectancy. Yes, I am 27, and last year I am so scared to be 30, then 40. Really, I can imagine that once I will not look so young as now. Losing my grandma. She's my whole world and helped me more than my own mom. Getting dementia. I wouldn't be able to handle losing memories or forgetting people. My grandmom had it for five years, and it's a really big fear for me as well. It was so painful to see how your lovely person is forgetting everything. The worst was when she couldn't recognize me. Decision making. Fearing that one choice will set me on a path of regret and doubt. Wondering if I had chosen differently would lead to a much more fulfilling life. I took two tabs of LSD in early 2017, and I am 100% sure that I died and came to this reality where there is no more good. Just look. Coronavirus. The threat of nuclear war. Etc. I regret that decision every day, knowing that things can only get worse for me now. I find a bizarre and unexpected sort of comfort in the idea that I'm an NPC in someone's long-term acid timeline. Social rejection. It hits me so hard when it happens that I stop bothering try to make new friends. Huh. Joke's on them. I deliberately withdraw, isolate from them so they can't socially reject me. Death. I just can't handle the concept of just not existing anymore. Yeah, I hate thinking about your thoughts and personality and life just poofing out of existence and not going anywhere. Everything you were and felt, every memory you had, just gone, with no use anymore. Your brain, void of the electrical impulses that made you who you were. Nice try, monster who lives in my closet. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. Workers who got their bosses fired. How? I used to work at a title company and witnessed our department manager forge mortgage documents on a fairly regular basis. So when she went to upper management to throw the entire department under the bus for being behind on recording documents, I marched straight to HR to resign and let them know what she was doing. She was fired, and they called me and offered my job back before the week was out. Worked register at a tour company. I also had a manager who hated me for some reason. She was probably the person I've ever met constantly yelled at us for no reason, got on to me about answering questions, a new hire had when I was asked, not her, wrote down I was 30 minutes late for a shift when I was 2 minutes late, etc, etc. We had a sneaking suspicion that she was taking money from our tills, as she was always the one who counted down the till when someone got fired for stealing cash. I made it a habit to count down every bill when I gave it back to a customer because we would get docked if we were even $1 off. So if a customer had $23 in change, I'd count 20. One, two, three in front of them. So I knew I had given back the right amount. We also had cameras pouring at the registers. Well, one day my GM pulls me aside and says $20 was missing from my till, and they were going to fire me. I straight up told my boss she could look at the cameras because I counted out all my bills for customers. Lo and behold, was the one who counted down my till and got caught on tape pocketing the money. She was gone by my next shift. You, Jennifer. I won. Why wouldn't they be checking cameras regardless if they're going to fire someone for stealing? What idiots.
I didn't say it was a well-run company. I had a job that required my supervisor to be doing evaluations of my cases and charts. She just had it in months. She and my director ordered me and my co-workers to do our own chart audits, fill out the forms, and they would sign off. I was so tired of not having adequate supervision, staff meetings weekly where she yelled at us, and invariably someone cried due to the stress and lack of support, and not having been paid enough to do everything I was doing and their job, I refused. I was told to do it or I would be fired. Nope. So I got fired. On the way out to my car, I called my former director, who had moved to another agency. She set up an interview for the next day, and I had a new job within 24 hours. She asked me what had happened at that interview. I spilled all the tea. Her sister-in-law was on the board of the previous agency, so she called her, and I told her everything too. Director was fired, and supervisor was reprimanded and put on close monitoring. She had killed any chance of promotion and left shortly afterwards, I'd heard. I was just happy to have jumped ship from that toxic mess. I should have left months earlier. Not my story, but my mother's. I watched on the sidelines as a teenager. My mother's job was basically a professional fundraiser. I really don't know what else to call it. People came to her for help to raise money for nonprofits or other foundations that needed it. This was a long time ago before social workers were more of a mandatory thing at high schools. My high school was very poor and did not have one. So my mother took it upon herself to set up a fundraiser to pay the salary of a social worker so my high school could have one. After raising all the money, she went to talk to the principal, who flat out refused to take any of it and said the position just wasn't necessary. My mother was pretty upset and just decided she would donate the money to supplies or something like that. I honestly have no idea what she did with it, but it did go to some sort of charity. After a few months at a Christmas party, the superintendent of all the public schools in the area was at the same party, and he struck up a conversation with my mother. After some small talk, my mother said that it was such a shame the principal didn't take the money for the social worker's position. The superintendent was dumbstruck and then told her that he had ordered the principal to find funding for that position. And when superintendent asked him about it, he replied with, No one is interested in that and we just couldn't get the money for it. Needless to say, he lost his position and whenever we came back from the holiday break, the school was hiring for his position. The cynic in me wonders if the principal worried that a social worker would call him out on whatever he was doing. I had a boss who was skimming off employee hours at Walmart. I took screenshots of my employees' hours on Thursday before the shift started, and then screenshots of their hours on Friday that showed all of them had a couple hours skimmed off their work week. I was a low-level manager. He was an upper-tier manager. He got fired. I believe his motivation was that he wanted to get promoted and wanted to show he could get done more in less man hours. Probably would have impacted his bonus, too. Management was giving an injured worker not wanting to pay him, accusing him of gold bricking. Worker said, tell you what, do the right thing here or you will be sorry. Management said, take your best shot. Worker called the EPA and APCD, told them where to find the logs that showed discrepancies in toxic material storage and usage. Sheriff's deputies showed up and raided the offices. Field supervisors from 10 years ago that had retired got subpoenaed. It was epic. Cost the company massively in fines and remediation. All because you wanted to with one poor Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What positive effects has the quarantine had for you? I'm finally not exhausted. I've slept better than I have in years. I'm broke AF, but at least I'm sleeping. LOL. I don't believe sleep impacted my health and well-being before this. Because I can function on little sleep, I thought I was one of those lucky people that didn't need sleep. I've learned I needed the sleep I wasn't getting. Feel like a different person. I was burnt out at work and was being social all the time so spending quality time with myself has been great. 
On top of that, not having time to myself resulted in me not cooking my own meals, and I've gained a bit of weight in the last year. I've been cooking my own healthy meals and going out for long bike rides. No idea if I have lost weight, I get obsessive over the scale. I have been living in sweats and leggings the last few years, and decided it was time to put effort in how I look. I've started learning about how fashion works and sold or donated some of my clothes. My room was depression messy, and I cleaned it right after my work shut down and have kept it clean since. I've been going on daily walks in wooded areas, noticing things in nature I'd never paid attention to before. I feel awful even saying it, but I work in software, so my job and productivity didn't change one iota. It took me about an hour one way to get into the office, and I'd usually buy a lunch instead of make one, though lord knows I tried. I even subbed to our meal prep Sunday without ever actually prepping anything. That counts, doesn't it? Being home, I do cook a lot more, though. My son is also not in daycare, which was costing me $170 a week. No more gas, plus no more going out to eat, plus no more daycare, plus no more random I'm tired and don't feel like cooking, let's just go out, equals thousands of dollars appearing into the savings account seemingly overnight. Oh man, so many positives. I bartend in a restaurant, so I've been laid off and collecting unemployment, and it's more money than I make in a week. I paid off my credit card debt, my carpal tunnel is healed, and I've been drinking significantly less. Quit smoking. I've been cooking more, saving money by not going out. I have a regular sleep schedule. I've been reading more. I've lost weight. I don't wear makeup anymore, and my skin cleared up. I got a puppy, and I've had all the time I need to train him, and so much more. This run-on sentence could go on for hours. I think the best thing is realizing how important it is to make the most of my time away from work and establish a routine that doesn't revolve around a job. Due to my job and the hours I work, I spend most of my time alone. There are days when the only people I see are the person who worked before me and the one who works after me. But now my roommates work from home, and I actually have people to talk to and be around. I feel like it's been good for my mental health. This is the opposite of my situation. Before, I only saw people when I went out. Now I don't see anyone. Not good for my mental health. It made it feel right for me to be by myself. Been saving a ton of money. I can't believe how much less I'm spending on lunches and coffee breaks and takeout. Our grocery bill is up maybe 40 bucks a month, but our food budget is easily at least 100 bucks lower a week. I'm one of those people who started to do their balcony. Three years in a row, my balcony was dirty and without any plants. Now I cleaned up and put some plants and it starts to look really nice. Careful, I started with two plants and now it's well over 100. Gardening is an amazing but addictive hobby, but it's the best feeling watching them grow a little bigger each day. It forced me to change my business from catering big parties to serving carry-out dinners a few at a time. I made a decent living from catering, sure, but I'm making an absolute killing on these dinners, and now I even get to take weekends off. Plus, whenever large parties become a thing again, I will have introduced myself and my product to several hundred potential clients with a marketing expenditure of $7. The cost of the sign I put by the side of the road that simply says, Dinner. I have started working out. Loving not having the commute. I can wake up five minutes before work starts and I'm fine. And at five o'clock, I'm instantly home. And you get chores done around the house during the workday, which makes my weekends truly mine. I mowed the lawn at lunch Thursday. Loving this home stuff. No tollway fees, no fast food lunches. I've had time to learn more about myself. I am in recovery from alcohol abuse, so after years of numbing myself, I've been relearning how different emotions feel and how I react to those emotions in a safe environment. I haven't worked since March 16th, and now I'm a couple weeks away from finishing my first novel. Suffering from bipolar 2, the boredom pushed me to clean my room, do the laundry every week, and fold it. It may not sound much, but for a person who hated doing chores, it really changed me. Also, my girlfriend and I have a deeper bond and understanding of each other. It's amazing what boredom can do. I started this YouTube channel. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, 
and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload. Welcome to Reddit Reader. What is the most effective psychological trick you use? If they can do it, I can do it. Almost every single job, position, title, or accomplishment has been achieved by someone that other people look at and go, how the f did that moron make it to where he is? And if those morons can do it, I sure as f can do it as well. I did this with myself when I was learning to drive. Predictability means safe. I'm a school teacher with a high number of students with trauma. Major issues while getting my routines established, but they're now super warm to me because I'm reliably predictable. I have two outfits that I alternate. A Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and a Tuesday, Thursday. Same greeting at the start of class, same start to every class, etc. Have very transparent discipline too. They know exactly what gets a detention and what doesn't. If they can predict what will happen, they feel safe because they're in control of choosing their outcome for the day. Children and people like feeling in control. Recently, my fiancé's cousin told us about how she doesn't give her children the option of whether or not to have veggies. She gives them the option of how much they get. Usually something like, would you like one helping of green beans or two? Of course, they happily choose one, sometimes two, weird kids. And they do it with a big smile on their face, like they just got away with something, lol. I think it's called the hairy arms trick. When I'm about to hand in the first version of a piece of work, I will leave a small but noticeable error that's easy to fix. It's always the error that my boss notices and suggests changing, which means that he or she feels involved in the process, but also doesn't nitpick for something arbitrary to criticize. I wish I knew about this trick when I had to write short medical segments for the local news. If I showed my editor something that I felt was perfect, he would make me move sentences around for an hour and end up almost exactly where we started. Talk softer so people either de-escalate or pay more attention. This. There is a 16 year age gap between myself and my youngest sister. When she got to the tantrum age, I would sit near her and start talking quietly. If she wanted to hear me, she had to stop throwing a tantrum. Saved my teenage sanity. Remember people's names. Greet them by it when you see them, even if that's the only time this week you might. People really like it when someone remembers them. It's easy credit. Fake it till you make it can really trick yourself into doing something you didn't want to do. For example, I really don't feel like starting on my report. Let me just pretend that I'm interested in doing it look over the data, and act like I was getting any information out of them. And then, next thing I know, I was balls deep into my report. I wouldn't call it a trick, but empathizing with someone goes a long way. If you can explain their perspective back to them in a way that actually proves you understand it, you have a much better chance of getting them to listen to your perspective. I'm not nervous. I'm excited. Nerve killer every time. Doctor. Okay, it's just a prostate exam, and it might be slightly uncomfortable, but it'll take just a second, and there's no need to be nervous. Me. I'm not nervous. I'm excited. Doctor. You can remind yourself to do any task by leaving a random object in the middle of the floor on your way out of the room. When you come back in, you'll see the object and remember why you left it there. Works every time. I tried this. I just ended up going, uh, right, I need to do that, while stepping over the object and procrastinating. Ben Franklin Effect If someone doesn't like you, convince them to do you a favor or lend you something. It'll trick their subconscious into convincing them that they like you. Very handy at work. Silence. It's so powerful. If you want to find out more about what someone is really thinking or feeling, instead of nodding along or using some verbal filler, I just don't say or do anything. It's amazing how people respond. So often as people, we interrupt each other before things reach a deeper level. Plus, some people find silence uncomfortable and need to fill it. I've found out so much this way. If you tell someone you need their help, they are more likely to do what it is you want or need, rather than you telling them to just do it. Hey little Jim, when you get done with dinner, I need your help in the kitchen. Little Jim. Okay, Dad. 
shows up. Tell him you're loading the dishwasher, put a couple of plates in, and he'll help and then thank him after. Or, Little Jim, after dinner you need to do the dishes. Little Jim, off you old Big difference. Don't forget to like this video if you liked it, dislike if you disliked it, and subscribe so you don't miss our next upload.